Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Confabulation with Aishinia. Today, we are very delighted to have a very important guest here with us today. We're your host for this episode. I'm Ife. I'm Winston. And this guest today, for our first episode, he's a national track and field athlete with two SEA Games gold medals, marathon titles under his belt, winning the event in 2015 and then defending his title in the 2017 Games. He's also one of the most successful track and field athletes in Singapore's history, currently holding five national records in the 5KM, 10KM, half marathon, and full marathon. Recently, he made headlines by running the fastest ever recorded time over 2.4 kilometers in Singapore, or 6 minutes and 53 seconds, a distance that holds a very special place in the hearts of all Singaporeans. Although he has so much past accomplishment, he still strives to achieve greater heights, having already qualified for the 1,005 meters event in the SEA Games next year, and is gaining qualification for the 10,000 event in 10,000 meters event in the Asian Games in 2022. Our guest, our guest for today is none other than So Rio. Hi everyone, thanks for getting me on your first ever episode. Bro, do you get our do you get your details right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys were very you just did your homework. I'm very yeah. impressed. Thanks. This is a very, very impressive resume. How how has yeah. training been for you so far? Uh well, okay, so tra- training, I mean training obviously has changed a lot uh in this whole pandemic era. Like, you know. I, I believe in 2019, <clears throat> I was taking a lot of things for granted, like, you know, like, you know, competitions, you know, the ability to like travel for competitions or training camps or, or whatever it might be. But when it came to 2020 and the world kind of locked, shut down and competitions were closed, I actually went through a bit of like a, I don't know what you can call it, like an identity crisis, quarter life crisis, you're wondering like what's happening with your life and like, um, should, should we still be running? Like, should we, should we be moving on to other things? Because it was just so uncertain. So yeah, I went through a bit of a, I wouldn't call it depression, but I would re- really call it a, like a loss of motivation and like didn't have a lot of drive to go out there and like train hard. So but my 16K runs became like, you know, 6K, just like <laughs> exercising to, to, to stay in shape. Um, but yeah, and then 2021 rolled around and decided, I decided to like get back on the, get back on the horse again and try and get fit again. And turns out this has been my best year so far for running. So pretty cool. So um, I understand it can be quite daunting, right? especially during the lockdown. Just wondering, like, what is your motivation of getting back onto the track, like training seriously? Uh, that's a very good question. So I would say that actually it was non-running related reasons that pushed me back into like competing and training again. Because I, I, I always felt that even without competitions, I would still run, I would still exercise. And I did. But it was just the sense of satisfaction was not the same. Like instead of like looking forward to training, like looking forward to going to the track and like doing a hard workout with my with my training partners, right? I was just running alone because you know lockdown and stuff. And it it came to the point where we're working from home from morning to evening. I mean, I, I it, it was it was nice to work from home, like you know nine to six. But then after that, I felt like I was having to drag myself out of the house and go for like a forty minute one hour job. And previously, I was like looking forward to training. And I think a lot of it was like, we didn't really have something to look forward to. We didn't have a goal to look forward to. So I lost a lot of that drive. And I found that without that drive and like um, positive uh, mindset and goal and it, that comes with like chasing a certain goal, I didn't really have that kind of drive in many other aspects of my life as well. So I was a bit, I was like less happy. I was like, you know, less fulfilled, I would say. Uh, sometimes I'll get grumpy and and like now when I trace back like a lot of it actually link back to you know didn't, not having that running goals to kind of anchor my life in a certain way and like structure my lifestyle in a certain way so it's it was actually amazing I actually realized that how much like you know running really meant to me so I mean, it doesn't have to be running like everyone has their different goals you could be um you could be running your own business or you could be um, learning a new language or whatever it might be. But anything that gives you that positive excitement and energy, I think it's something important to have in your life. For me, it just happens to be sports. Right. And I think as a sports fan, I can definitely relate to it. There's a lot of cancellation of all the major sporting events. And that's something that was really upsetting for us. We, we, we ran for our school track and field team. We were fortunate enough to finish our final year right before the lockdown period. So our oh, juniors, nice. yeah, they didn't manage to be able to run in the sports hub and have that experience. So uh, I think we were really fortunate to be able to be able to just squeeze in our final year before all this happens. But I think competition is starting to open up now, especially for you. I understand that you have a very big event coming up next month, which is the Bukhari Sweat 2.4 Challenge. And because I've been following you for quite a while, I know you tried to attempt the seven minutes barrier a bit in the past, but due to, like, I think it was rain, rain on the day itself, we weren't able to do it. 
and then COVID, it all happened. So my, my question is like, what, what gave you the idea of attempting this distance, given that it's not like a traditional distance and, and why sub seven minutes? Uh, okay, yeah, very good question. So, so the thing about um the two point four okay the thing about two point four k that I wanted to why I wanted to do this event is because you, you talk about you talk about all these other distances like five k ten k half marathon marathon like I think people kind like if you, okay in track and field people people will know what they are uh the mainstream Singapore public doesn't pay a lot of attention to it so like you know I could go out and set a five thousand meter record tomorrow I actually I did like two months ago uh in July and. I felt that that was one of the best performances of my life because, you know, to set a distance record in Singapore in our kind of heat and humidity without, without a lot of competition on Kalan practice track is mm. not, I mean, it's never happened before. Like, you know, it's, it's, okay. it's, uh, so, uh, and I took like seven seconds off the old mark, which was, I think, like, if I may say so myself, I think it was a huge improvement. And the previous record was set in Japan where the weather was cooler. So I, I felt that that was probably one of the best performances of my life. But I would say outside of the track and field fraternity, maybe maybe Mothership covered it a little bit. And like, so uh, people who read Mothership like saw it, but it didn't exactly set people talking, you know, because track and field is such a niche event by itself. No one really like talks about, we don't really have sports culture in Singapore. No one really talks about track and field, especially. But 2.4, every, like everyone is, everyone has done it. Everyone is either has been forced to do it at some point in their life or, uh, I mean, males will have to do it every single year, right? For IBBT. Yeah, as long as you are um active NS man. So it was something that I felt like, okay, I spoke to Pokari and I, and I, and I asked them, like, you know, uh, as an ambassador, I wanted to know what they wanted to do for the year. And they were like, oh, we wanted to have this marketing event that really drives um the, the, the brand awareness and, like, you know, has, like, touch points with hearts of Singaporeans. I said, okay, well, we, we don't have the budget to compete with a Stan Chart Marathon. We don't have the budget to go and compete with a Great Eastern Women's Half Marathon. But we, so we have to pivot. We have to find a way that, you know, you can have a strategic event that you don't have a lot of budget to hold, but you can, you can at the same time, like really reach out to a lot of people. And I said, let's do 2.4K. And they were like, oh, like why 2.4K? You know, like they were, they were a bit uh, confused as to why this distance. But, you know, 2.4K, is something that every Singaporean understands. And this will only work in Singapore because no other country in the world, like, you know, you say 2.4 and everyone understands what you're talking about. Uh, as for, so I, so I mean, I said, let's do it. I said, I will train. I will try and run sub seven minutes because I know that sub seven minutes has not been done officially by any Singaporean in Singapore. Like, any Singaporean full stop. So, so, like, you clock a sub seven, 2.4, you have a video proving it and like, you know, electronic timing and everything. I think that will set the standard uh, like, I mean, you guys have been in the sport. Like, you know that even sub eight is not, say, very easy. But sub seven, like, you probably haven't seen before. Like. So, I see many people haven't seen the sub seven. So there are some claims that people have run sub seven in the past, but I think a lot of these are also like exaggerated or mistaken claims. Like, some of them come different shit SOC from two point four. Some of them, but they will tell you, oh, you know, like last time my friend, uh, in in army, like twenty years ago, he can run like six thirty two point four. And then he smoked, and then he's like, you know, kind of cop stories, lah. But <laughs> so he was like, okay, like let's set the record straight. Like our like national athlete, like two times Sea Games champion, like multiple record holder. He will train for two point four, and he will run two point four as fast as he can. And this will be like, I mean, commonsensically, this would suggest that what a two point four k standard is, lah. So he you know, managed to run six five three, and yeah, that's basically the story of how um the event came together and then and then the result went viral like the video of the race went viral and, and everyone was talking about it and way more people were talking about the 2.4 than the 5k when i actually feel that my 5k was a better performance yeah so i mean it is what it is uh sometimes to i, I feel that for the sport to remain relevant to the mainstream audience sometimes you have to adapt and like uh do special events that help you connect with fans who are outside your niche area yeah I think you're, you're very right. Uh, like, uh, the buzz you have generated is like quite unprecedented for the for track and field in Singapore. Uh. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, especially after you draw like comparison to the commando and NDU formation, right? Like a lot of people start to voice their displeasure, uh, Whether they're saying like maybe you are arrogant or, or stuff. Just wonder, wonder like what what is your feeling towards that? Like, do you have any comment? Eve is commando, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Ife yeah. offended or not, Ife? No, no, no. I, actually, I, 
I, I can speak from a point of view of a commando, and I can also can speak from a point of view of a track and field athlete. Yeah, so knowing the pacing for sub seven minutes, which is if I'm not wrong, it's around sixty seconds, sixty nine seconds a lap, right? Mm. I I think that's that's really really difficult to do for two three rounds, let alone six rounds around the track. Mm. So I. I do acknowledge the fact that you know set up seven minutes is really an astonishing accomplishment. Uh. And even for myself, uh, in commando, I've never ran anything close to close to anywhere near the times that you're running. So, hey, okay, in commando, right? Do you all run it on the track? I'm just curious because I've heard stories that it's not on the track. Do you all run it like, around camp or on the track? Uh, it was. It's around. We currently we do it around the Ferry Square. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's on road. Okay, yep. and then and then like, is it loops around the parade square or what? Yeah, it's um. Okay, it's been quite a while since I've done it, but I, I believe it's four four and a half rounds around the parade square. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. La, I mean. Okay. So, um, naturally, when I say two point four k, I I I I mean, I I run under the assumption that it's on the track, like You know, because and I, when I say no one has run sub sub seven on the track. For two point four, like, and that's what I mean, like, Because you know, if it's on the road, like, I, I, I can, I can say a road is two point four k. But if I never actually like get an official race measurer to go and like, you know, mark it out and like ensure that it's like two point four zero zero, I mean, it can be shorter, it can be uphill to downhill, it can be a whole lot of things. Like, so I, I don't know, I don't know what the situation is over at the commando camp, but um, yeah, there, there are, there are people who who claim that. Or the commandos can easily run below seven, or and, and a lot of these people are probably not runners, so they just they just anyhow claim. But then it was this one group of commandos, la, like 40 plus year old, and then they were saying, Oh, like last time 20 years ago, like it was very, very common in our camp for people to run below seven. And I'm just like, Oh, come on, la, like this is complete nonsense. Like it's really un- it's impossible because if you have that many guys who are running below seven, these guys would be like national class already at 1005 5k. C games class already at thousand five five k, but it's just like you know. I mean, if they can match me at two point four k, there's no reason why they wouldn't be as good at thousand five or five k lah. And then they will be they will be able to compete. Um, like they will, they will be our best for sure. They will be able to compete at C games. So it was just like okay, like I don't want to say so much. I don't believe that is that common. I don't believe that these people who are saying they can do it can do it. Like so, this is the challenge lah. So I think it was the but you know. These are elite like army units, right? Like okay, I, I think that I didn't really talk about NDU. We have small commanders because commanders were making the, the most noise, I would say. So the command I was like, yeah, commanders are like, you know, not just commanders, like anyone who thinks you can run sub seven in Singapore, like come. Then if you can run sub seven, I pay you 700 bucks and I buy you 700 dollars of Pukari sweat. So it's like subtle plug my sponsor also. Yeah. And then but you know how commandos are, la, they don't like being challenged. So like they inst- but instead of like taking up the challenge, they like like went like completely um fire fiery on social media and like you know some of them were like copying my 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 uh posts or my words like sometimes they'll crop out like one paragraph and like put it out of context and put it in the the commando alumni group and then like a whole lot of people just jumping on board without no head no tail they just whack lah but yeah i mean like the more people talked about it the, the more hyped up it, be, it became so in my head i'm also processing it i'm like Sure, like maybe some people might perceive arrogance on my part, but as long as people are talking about the sport and people are like, you know, generating interest in, in, in this event and track and field in general, I don't think it's a bad thing. Lah. I'd rather people be debating about whether or not something is possible in the sport rather than no one caring about the sport. And if I have to like, you know, take a bit of like heat on my end, I mean, sure, lah, I mean, I, I can take it. Lah, you know? <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not something that I'm um, going to be... Uh, like oh no, I don't be able to 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 hunt me, so I don't say anything here. Yeah. yeah, actually, um, basically some context for our audience, right? Uh, uh, Ray Yong actually posts out open challenge to anyone local Singaporean who can run below seven minutes for two point four, and there are a lot of prizes for people who can do that, lah. So anyone here from this uh podcast who's interested <laughs> can sign up also. Yeah, yeah. not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just keeping an eye out for the um the the, the COVID restrictions because I think we were just, it was just announced yesterday or two days ago that we're tightening restrictions a bit. So uh we wanted to flag up people in fives. Now social groups are in twos. So I just hope that you know, like if the event doesn't like okay, I'm I'm in favor of health first. So if we have to postpone the event, so be it. But like we're confident that the event will happen. It's just a matter of when. Oh. Yeah. 
do you think if it changed from five to two people, you will like affect affect your performance? If we, the, we won't go on, we won't go ahead. It's just two per hit because it's just too many hits, you know. All right. Yeah, you'll be like two and a half times the amount of time to 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 right. flag off every single race. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And like, yeah, in a race, if it's just two people, it's a bit lame, like, You know, you you want to like. Gotcha. At least five competing together, yeah. Actually, just a curious question. Do you foresee anybody on the day, like looking at the start list, like do you foresee anybody on the day to be able to come close? I would say that in Singapore, there are only three of us who have the capability as of now to run sub seven. And that will be myself. That will be Ipanesh, uh Sounder Raraja. He's a SEA Games representative in the 5K. Currently trains with me at uh, Active SG Athletics Club with Coach Stephen Quack and Ethan Yen who from Hua Chong. I don't know are you from Hua Chong? Yeah, yeah oh, um, okay. we competed with him before. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you guys are aware of Ethan. Yeah. So Ethan yeah. ran 406 for 1005 earlier this year. He's he's actually I would say Ethan Ethan's 1005 is like way better than mine when I was his age. Actually it's way better than all of us when we were his age, like Jivanesh and myself. So <laughs> Like he's he, he, Ethan Jivanesh and I trained together. Um, I'm I'm better at the I'm better at the longer workouts for sure. But like at the shorter stuff, we are all quite evenly matched, lah. Yeah, the thousand five, the kind of stuff. So I I do believe that two point four is a good distance for them, and it will take a good race from them. But I believe they can run somewhere in the range of like six fifty five to six fifty nine on a good day. On, on a, but they need they, they they need good training and like a good race day to, to get below seven yeah uh, and then apart from the two of them I also invited the Guka record holder um, Subhas Gurung so he's run 658 in like in his camp but no competition so I think with competition he can go faster what's, what's your target given a strong competition a strong lineup running together with you well my personal target would be to break my own record uh, which is 653 yeah. anything faster than that would be amazing Right. Actually, because speaking from a traditional Asian family standpoint, most families just want their kids, you know, study well, get a good degree, get a good job. But then, um, has your has your family always been supportive of you choosing a, the life of a professional athlete, given that there's not much Singaporeans who have done it before? Uh, I would say that definitely had, like, I think definitely they had their concerns because especially like in JC, you know, they saw me like training a lot. They were like, oh, don't forget to study. You know, A-level is very important. Then when I was in uni, yeah, like in uni, definitely a bit more freedom. Um, but then after uni, when I was like, uh, there were some points I really struggled to balance like work and running because like uni, you still have a lot of like free time. Work is kind of like, wow, it's nine to six and then training after is like very, very tiring. Uh. So uh, some, uh, they felt that my work performance could potentially be suffering because you know I was still taking running so seriously but so they were like you know like uh, I mean we had a few conversations from time to time and they were like oh like running like just just do what you can can already like don't take it so seriously you know like end of the day your career is what is important but for me running goals were always at the top of my I mean like sports was always at the top of my priorities so if I had to like let's see if I had to prioritize sports over work and it meant that I wouldn't get promoted as fast because I could I could accomplish less in the office or what. I would always like choose that that option because like for me work was a way of keeping myself financially afloat, um, and allowing me to do my sport. <laughs> and and yeah, and so it was, it was if I were to give up sports and like take work more seriously, then I think that that wasn't what I wanted to do like. That wasn't my list of priorities. So I I guess that you know we all have twenty four hours a day. We all have limited time and energy, so we really have to choose what I'm to prioritize. And I would say eventually it paid off because eventually I was offered a professional athlete contract from Under Armour. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm compensated fairly well, and I still have the flexibility to work outside of my training and and recovery hours. So yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Some people might say at the age of thirty they want to they want to have a car and a house. Then, then sorry, like you probably shouldn't be in sports unless you're making so much money from sports. Yeah, right. I mean, like, I of course I have plans in the future to get my own place and stuff, but just at this point of time, not yet. Like, now I'm focusing on sports and like you know, thankfully for me, I get along well with my parents. Um, like my family and I are really are really quite close. 
some people cannot stand living with their family. They want to like move out as soon as possible. But like that's not the case for me. So like yeah, quite peaceful. We, we live here together and not in a rush to go out there and uh, like spend like a few hundreds of thousands of dollars to to get to get your own place. Yeah, I would say don't go and do something because society forces you to or your parents are forcing you to because if that's not what you want, you're not going to be happy. You know, you're just going to be a robot like like working to pay off uh, bills. And that's not what we want. Though. That's, that's very true. Yeah. yeah. You can tell you are really quite passionate about the sports. Lah. And um, so like a school person who is still schooling, right? Uh, one part of uh, sporting that is very interesting to us, right? Is that how do you balance between like academic and sporting? I feel like it's something that a lot of us want to know about. So. Uh, okay. So again, this comes down to... to this comes down to priorities, like, and also it comes down to how gifted you are. Like, if you are academically damn bright, uh, and you're the type that can study a bit and then like absorb everything and like, and like study very fast, then fantastic like, Then you you will have additional time and energy for sports, for socializing, for, for other things. And I, I say that I sacrificed a lot of social life when I was in university. Um, I never had a girlfriend when I was in university. I, I never like dated anyone seriously when I was in university. So I think that's a huge time and emotional commitment that I didn't have to deal with. Okay, yeah. That's number one. Um, I didn't. I had. I have friends, but a lot of my friends were also through the sport, so like they could identify with whatever I was doing. I had friends from outside sports, obviously, um, but yeah, I, I wasn't the type that would go to house parties like every every single weekend and, and, and stuff like that. Well, now now I think now with COVID actually. It's a lot easier to balance sports and studies because there's a lot of social stuff that that, that doesn't it's not allowed to happen that would, would usually happen in the past in university. And then and then studies is studies all like uh you do what you can. Um I was always satisfied as an A to B student. And occasionally I'll get a C for subjects that I may not be super um strong in, but it's not like I will let it bother me. it's not like you know, I'll get depressed if I don't get straight A's. It's not like it's not that I study like from morning to night until no time to do anything else. I, I was just like put aside like, okay, today I'm going to study for four hours and then that's it. Then I'm going to focus on training. I'm going to focus on other things in my life. I'm going to go and sleep. I, you know, I plan my day out and I allocate time for each, each activity. Like. So like, I would say that like, A, don't waste time. B, don't go and like overkill. Like. like at the end of the day, you graduate from uni, you got your degree. That's good enough. No one's going to care if you spend like 14 hours studying or you spend four hours studying a day as long as you get your degree and, and move on with life. Uh, once you get your first job, uh, it's your job performance that counts. It's no, long, no one's going to ask you what's your GPA. Like, okay, next time when you apply for a job, really no one's going to ask you what's your GPA. Some exceptions, maybe if you work for certain companies, like government organizations, for example, your pay is packed to your, your what, what, what class of degree you earn. So like for me, I, I was a second upper. So I earned maybe like two, three hundred dollars per month more than someone with a second lower, but a bit less than someone with a first class. Hmm. But that's it, like, you know, like like three hundred dollars per month is like three point six K a year. It's not a lot of money, you know. It's not something that is life changing. Mm-hmm. Um and especially like yeah, when you're working. I mean when you're working and then, and then like, you know, if you're good in sports, there's there are other ways to earn money anyway. So it's like, yeah, like, don't 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 try and don't try and don't try and have it all. Don't try and like, don't, you cannot, especially if you're not of like extraordinary ability, you're not going to be a straight A student and be the most popular guy in school and win every single gold medal in sports and have the hot, and like, I don't know, and have the hottest girlfriend on campus. I mean like, you know, don't, I don't want everything. La. Like, I think sometimes people want everything and that's when they put themselves in too many different directions. Like, um, do your best but plan it out and be realistic and be content with what you can get. And yeah, I think the world is big enough for all of us. There's space for all of us to have our own success and happiness. Um, it doesn't come at the expense of each other. That's quite motivational. Yeah. <laughs> Just wondering how many times do you train, like for example, during your uni per week? Uh, well, during uni... Okay, so I... I attended two universities. I, I spent year one in NUS. I stayed in the hall, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge Hall. And I spent, yeah. And then I spent year 
two and three and four at the University of Oregon. So I went on exchange and loved it there so much. I never came back. I transferred my credits there and I continued to con- con- continue there. I, uh, thankfully, I was on scholarship, so I was able to, uh, uh, I was on government scholarship, I was able to get it paid off. But uh, point being, the University of Oregon, when I was there, I trained a lot more because I was like training with um, athletes who were, who were training at like a really high level. So here I ran maybe like five times a week maximum. Did I ever run six times? I'm not sure. But like it would be like Monday, Thursday would be hard intervals and Saturday would be a long run and then like everything else would just be like, you know, easy runs to, to, to keep the body like recovering and, and, and like do some light aerobic work. Lah. As for when I was in Oregon, I was running a lot more. There were some days I'll run twice, like before class, up after class. Like before class, go to class, come back, take a nap, run after class. I would say I spent a lot more time on, on running when I was there. And it was like, I, I still did well enough. I got a second upper. But at the same time, it's like, my a lot of focus was on running. Because I, I was preparing for SEA Games when I was there. I qualified for SEA Games when I was there. I was preparing for SEA Games when I was there. When I graduated from there, I, I, I went to like, um, I actually trained full-time for eight or nine months before I started work. Yeah, just to give myself a shot and see what I could do. I ran 224 for the marathon. So it, I, I battled some injuries, but I ran 224 for the marathon. So that was really close to uh, what was the recorded national record at that point of time. And then I eventually broke the national record like um, two and a half years later while working while working and, and training. So yeah, it was, it was one of those... Um, one of those things where, like, like you guys say, I grew into the sport. So for year one of uni, didn't run, didn't train as much. But year, the year two, three, and four, that approach to training was a lot different. Yeah. But one thing that local athletes have to deal with is is the issue of uh, uh or rather the call of duty like national service when it comes up during the transition from you know your JC slash poly years to university training. You have to go through a period of uh, I'll say like non activity in the sport. Uh, because yeah. of national service. And I think you've been pretty vocal about it because before Joseph schooling and like Kwa when the deferment issue wasn't really, uh, the, the deferment option wasn't really one. And recently you wrote a open letter to MINDEF advising them on, you know, uh, giving them special, like special training programs so that they can continue to pursue their, their, their respective sports. So how, how do you, for some people that have been through NS, right, they'll feel that, you know, it's unfair and that every, Every Singaporean son has to do their part and serve the country full time. That's why it's called uh, NSF National Service full time. Then to, to those comments, what, what what do you say to them? Well, I agree that every Singaporean son should serve NS. I don't get me wrong. I, I don't believe that success in sports is a is the reason for exemption from NS. Now we do see examples of that in Korea where their best sportsmen get exempted. Um but you know that's Korea and Singapore is Singapore. So unless we write a, a law, a new law that states that success in sports will, will bring you exempted NS, I think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. You actually get a lot of people taking sports seriously and then like sports performance will go up. So fitness in general will go up in the country. So not, not, a, not the worst thing. Like. But why, why, what my open letter is suggesting to me that is, you know, I'm not saying don't serve. Like these guys need to serve NS, go and serve NS. But you know, NS, there are so many different things you can do, right? Not everyone has to be a Chong Sua rifleman, like camo on for two years and like living in a jungle for two years, like like doing fire movement, you know? Like it's not, it's not the, it's not everyone that needs to do that. Like, like not everyone needs to be, I mean, I'm sure you go through hell, hell, hell in commandos. Like commandos are actually like uh, one of the most respected vocations for good reason, if not the most respected, because you guys, train really hard and you guys do a lot of stuff that other vocations don't do. Some vocations are, are a lot more slack. Like, like <laughs> honestly speaking, a lot, some vocations are a lot more slack. So it's what they do in the, in the army, right? It's like, I'm sure that the army has space for people who can serve their NS, but also like handle a sports training load. And if our soldiers cannot find time to do sports, then you know, what kind of like healthy or fitness lifestyle is the army like projecting? I think that the army has space, and Joseph and Joseph and Zheng Wen could be like the the forefront of like the army like sports program. If the army has a sports program, and like you get these two to front, hey, these two are like the best athletes in Singapore at the moment. 
definitely in swimming, but I think across all sports, you don't have guys who, I mean, Joseph obviously has won an Olympic gold medal and someone has met the Olympic semi-final. Like, you know, build a program around these guys. Like, you know, we used to have Safsa, and like Safsa is no longer existent. I don't know why. No one seems to know why Safsa died. But, you know, this, this is a fantastic chance to like give them a job that they will still serve the country. They will still learn um, the values that NS wants to inculcate in all Singapore males. And but they can also do their sports while doing it. I feel that it's really a that there is a creative way, just whether um yeah, our MINDEF wants to explore these creative ways to solve our solve our problem. Now. Our problem is that we don't want these two boys to who are phenomenal athletes to go into NS and like end their swimming careers, you know. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, moving on from like uh, NS and university, right? Um so we as we scroll through your Instagram, right, we realize that you went to a lot of like overseas training camp like in Kenya and in like high attitude areas. Um, how do you feel that exposure to overseas training like, benefit you? Uh, it really opens your mind up to how hard these successful athletes train, what we are lacking and what we can uh like you know when I go to Kenya, for wow, these guys like every day they train two times a day and then like you know train in big groups. So I also I mean like the training in big groups really like shows the power of a group like yeah they really like it's so much easier to go for a run when you're meeting a friend or meeting a group than, you know, like having dragged yourself out of the house and doing it alone. So, but then you know, sometimes I also like running alone, you know, it's peaceful and just work on your, like, just work on yourself. But I think for hard sessions, like definitely the being a group works. High altitude is a different kind of training. Like I, I think it, it helps to, to get out of Singapore every once in a while. Like Singapore is really very small and that's why Singaporeans like to go on holidays, you know, like change of scenery and stuff. Like when I go on training camp, instead of running on the road or, or at Bedok Reservoir or what, I'm running like through like beautiful forests and mountains and stuff. It's very, it's very, um, it's very good for the soul, you know, it's very refreshing for the soul and uh, psychologically you fall in love with running again and, and, and yeah, it's something that I, I would recommend. Like everyone goes on holidays, runners, like when I, when I go on quote unquote holiday, I'm actually working really hard on the holiday, but, I'm I'm really enjoying like what I'm able to get out of the trip. Right. You come back fitter and everything. Uh, just like how is your experience in like a country like Kenya? Like how is the accommodation, your meals, your lifestyle? How is it like over there? How is it like uh you so there are a few different options in, in Kenya. When, the first time I went, I stayed in a training camp. So in a training camp, like it's a training camp that's set up by Lorna Kip the Gut and her European husband mm-hmm. the husband is from Netherlands or something yeah so um it's a it's a bit more it's the, it's more expensive than like if we were to just like rent a house and, and stay there but what happened was that um and they take care of everything for you like your room everything is it's kind of like a hotel hmm. yeah it's kind of like a hotel I mean not 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 five class not, not five star hotel with aircon and everything but it's kind of like a hotel um breakfast breakfast lunch dinner all settled for you uh gym is there swimming pool is there it's like it's like a resort lah you know yeah, and then right. all you need to focus on is just train. Uh, the second time I went there, I already knew what things were like there. So I rented um, a house from a friend and then I stayed there and then I I, I already knew where everything was and I, I just, for, for breakfast, lunch, dinner, I could just like, uh, breakfast, I could bring myself, I like, just eat bread, like I buy sliced bread from the supermarket and, and not supermarket, from the, from the convenience store, whatever you want to call it there. And then, and then like, um, have your own breakfast. Lunch, you could go down to like the cafes and order um, whatever you needed to order. And yeah, you did lunch and dinner settle yourself. Um, so the, the, the unpleasant experience when we were rent, when I rented my own house there was that my, my, myself, my girlfriend, my sister were, were there. And one day someone like sneaked into our house and like stole like certain, certain like, he didn't steal very, very important stuff, like, but he stole like petty stuff. I think my sister's old iPod got stolen and stuff like that. Yeah. It was probably our fault for not checking, but we, I think we we didn't like latch the door or, or whatever. Like the, the gate outside was locked, but our door wasn't latched. So someone must have to like climb the wall and come in. Like when you're, when you're a foreigner there, people know you got money. So that people want to like... Mm-hmm. like it, it's not dangerous. Like people won't rob you in in the sit in the town of Itan, but they, they are not above like stealing, like. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah they, like if, if you leave stuff, if you leave your shoes outside the house, and it's nice enough. People will steal one. 
<laughs> okay. And then, then, and then, like when you're like lighter skin and you're there, they always come and ask you for money. Like the kids were like, you know, the first year they call you Mzungo. Like, can I have like Mzungo means like white white person? Or can you give me your shoes? Like, can you give me money? Can you give me? Can you give me sweets? Yeah, they 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 will just come up to you and ask. Yeah, so it, it's really quite eye opening. But people that are very poor, lah. So I think that like it, it also provides a lot of perspective. It also like you know it really helps you appreciate. Uh, what we have here and and yeah I mean, Kenya Ken, Kenya is always like a place I enjoy going back to and uh, sometime in the future I'm sure I'll be back again and are there a lot of uh, athletes from other countries who also like yes. you go to Kenya yes. like okay then my, my question would be like what what is it about Kenya and like maybe the training there that would draw high level athletes from all over the world to concentrate to go there like what, what can they do in Kenya that like you can't do in, let's say, America, or you can't do in, in UK, some, something like that? Uh, good question. So Kenya's weather, because it's situated on the equator, is actually really the predictable year round. And it's not like, okay, so Singapore is also on the equator. So you no, know, our weather here, you can train year round. But in Kenya, it's actually, it's really cool. Like it's like maybe 15 to, to 25 degrees uh, year round because it's, it's higher up, it's in the mountains. Yeah. Okay, not the whole of Kenya, but this particular town, Iten, is in is is in the mountains. It's like two point four k above sea level. Mm-hmm. So the the higher you are, the cooler it is. So the weather is like very predictable year round. Like you know, cool weather, uh, altitude, high altitude, um, very welcoming people. Uh, this is so cheap. I think more importantly is cheap. So the Europeans, they will come down to Kenya in the winter when it's too cold to have proper training in Europe. They come down to Kenya to escape the winter and like train in nice weather. Yeah. So that's why a lot of Europeans go there. Americans less so because Americans, they like, they kind of like stick around in their own country. So like if it's, if it's too cold in certain states, they, they can move. I mean, America is so big, right? So they go to Black Star or they go to like Florida or whatever and like do a training camp there. So you don't get too many Americans going to Kenya, but you get a lot of Europeans. Yeah. And I think that like, it's also the it's also the the intrigue, like, you know, it's like, oh like go to Kenya and train. Like, it's a very it's a very, very cool uh narrative. It's a very, very like interesting journey that people want to they want to see for themselves. Because Kenyans are known to be so good in distance running. They, people want to see and people want to train like the Kenyans do. Yeah. And that's why you get a lot of people going to Kenya. What what, what would you say is your like your main takeaway from this training camp? Main takeaway, I mean, um, it's always like opening your mind to how hard people around the world train and like, uh, and how much the Kenyans believe in themselves and how much they believe that they can improve. And basically like, you know, don't, don't shortchange yourself by, by thinking you can't do it. They, 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 they really, they, they believe they can do it and they will go and do it. And even if they fail, they'll just come back the next day and try again, like, which I think is, um, which, I, which I think is a really, really like inspired. It was inspiring for me. So every time I go there, I always come back and and more motivated to you know push, push, push myself in training. Right. right. Oh. Okay. I I think uh, Rio, thank you so much for the conversation that we have today. Like I I posted when when I first announced that you know we're having a podcast and you are our first guest. I have a lot of my friends DMing me and asking, oh how how did you get him on? How did you get him on? Like especially with it being our first episode so like we are really grateful uh, to have you come on yeah <laughs> like um before you go do you mind if you like take a screenshot like a photo with... oh, sure, man. yeah yeah okay. um we actually have a friend behind the camera he's been listening in and he's been helping us to jot down the the points of the stuff okay. that we mentioned to make editing videos so like you write him to join the photo as well okay. yeah okay three two one wait uh... sorry Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Is it very nice? Bye bye. Bye bye.